Welcome to the show, Anton. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You all, Anton is my yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. And I have been, I think that Michael and I have been going to your class probably since the pandemic. Right around okay. that time was where we really started connecting in with the work that you're doing. And one of the things that I appreciated about you during that time in the world is how awake you were, mm -hmm. how conscientious you were about the decisions you were making and how really public you were about your voice, your, your perspective on what was going on in the world. Can you, can you talk us through a little bit about, about yeah, how you arrived? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting. It, um, that was a very pivotal time for me and my family. And, and I got a lot of clarity and some major um, shifts happen because I, I started to see things for what I believe them to truly be uh, within politics and society and the government and all these things. Um, and it just hit me so clear. And, and it was, you know, for me, it was, uh, there was a lot of cognitive dissonance because I grew up in this certain way of thinking. And I could tell you the two things I was adamantly against and I would never change my mind about. And those two things changed around the time of the pandemic. And um, yeah, I made it very obvious that something was up. I just knew from the get-go something felt off. And I was clear about that. I made I made my statements. I, I was I was obvious about it. And it actually wasn't the narrative of the yoga world. The narrative of the yoga world was, you know, basically I'm gonna sum it up in 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 this statement. In the yoga world, it was all about um, virtue signaling. That was my point of view is that it was, you had to virtue signal because in yoga, you're the good person, right? And you need to tell everyone how good you are and you need to be following what's right without investigating. And I see that a lot just in yoga, yoga in general where people don't ever ask why. Well, why, why do we do it like that? Why is it called that? Why, why, is, why are we doing it like that? So I'm always questioning. And I definitely question what was happening uh, around 2020 in the pandemic. And um, a lot of people didn't like my perspective on it. And um, I wasn't doing the virtue signaling. It was quite, quite the opposite. I was staying to my morals. And that was a place where I then created a whole new standard for how I was going to live. I took on a coach who I believe is a, a channel to source. Um, Kevin Walton is his name, Source Radiance. Um, he became my, my mentor and my coach. Uh, I met him through Sacred Sons Men's Organization. And that's when the deep dive started happening, where I had to look at some of these core beliefs I had that were just falling apart right in front of my eyes that weren't actually true or real. Um, so that's when the big shifts happened. I was pretty clear and vocal about it. And you were some of the few that came into that. And I call it the oil and water effect that happened it really for me. Is. It really uh, is. Oil yeah, and definitely water. within the yoga community, my community got much smaller. Mm -hmm. um, people, there's a lot of people who, who went away because they didn't agree with what I was doing and what I believe in. And I had to come to, to, to grips with that and, and recognize I, I can't please everybody, but I have to stay true to myself and my family and what's what I believe to be right. And they had to do the same thing, but there was this effect, the separation that happened. And a lot of people in my life disappeared. And then I also started to see who clearly was kind of on the same page. Um, it's almost like I, I put out that, that very obvious signal. Okay. Yes. This is where I'm at. And then yes. all the other people were like, Oh, this is where we're going. Okay, cool. I'll come here. <laughs> and the other people are like, no. And that's okay. Let's cut to it. What what was one of the beliefs that really came front and center to you that you had to wrestle with? And I'll, I'll just put it basically around the political belief of that um, being a liberal and being a Democrat means bottom line it, that you are the good guy. Mm -hmm. And and I was growing up. I grew up being taught that essentially. Um, and then I saw who was making the decisions that I didn't agree with who were taking away our sovereign rights as human beings um, and the constitution. I started looking into what actually the constitution means and everything that I was hearing that I heard before the opposite was happening. So they weren't the good guys. They were the ones instigating and, and all these things. So that like shook my world and to realize, Oh, wait a minute. I'm I actually, I'm not in this camp necessarily. That doesn't necessarily put me in the other camp either. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what I saw a lot of that was very disturbing is that, if I'm against me and my family or anybody getting a vaccine, then it obviously puts me in this camp over here. Or if I don't agree with, with Biden being president, then I obviously love Donald Trump, but which is not the case at all. Um, there's the space in between. And ironically, my class this week is about that theme, the space in between. The space and, in between. Right. And there is this place where I, I feel like that's where I am. 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a liberal. I'm not a conservative necessarily, but I'm recognizing a lot of my views are more family-based views. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly enough, I, I'm not a Christian. I don't call myself a Christian, but they lean more toward Christian-based views of family and, and structure that are really beautiful to creating a society of, of love and support for each other. Um, so yeah, it, it's been, that's been one of the interesting things. And, and there's some other stuff that, that came about that might be surprising that, you know, I was just adamant, like, no, this is a no. And then it was like, well, maybe. And I think a lot of it had to do with the right to choose. And, you know, everyone puts that on the abortion issue, but I'm not going to talk about that issue. The right to choose anything in general, what I do for me and what's right for me as a good abiding citizen, a moral upstanding person. And the kicker is, I think most people haven't established a standard for what that is for themselves. And around this time, that's what I got to do for me. Who am I really? What is it that I truly believe in? And what does it mean to be in integrity? Well, when I was asking those questions, I also saw where in my past I was out of integrity, or I was doing things from a space of lack or limitation or fear. Um, so there's some accelerated growth that happened in the last three years for me, for sure. That's amazing. I'm just reflecting on how you said that your community really shrunk. And a lot of the people who listen to my podcast are spiritual entrepreneurs, whether it's, you know, coaching, transformational work, anything like that. And I know that you had such a big following in the Scottsdale Phoenix area for sure. How did that affect your relationship with business and the, the work that you're doing? How did you navigate that? Well, um, I think a lot of people just kind of can, can in some way, some people were able to appreciate this is Anton standing for what he believes in. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, a lot of the people that I, that I work with actually felt the same way. They just weren't willing to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. the silent majority, which is yeah. what's going on, you know? Yeah. Um, so I wasn't that silent. Now, when you look on a bigger scale, like yoga festivals, I stopped getting asked to go to yoga festivals because I didn't fit that narrative of the the yoga. And, and anytime there was thing, well, oh yeah, there's going to be masks. I was like, well, I'm out. I'm not going anyway. And just by saying, oh, I won't be there if there's going to be a mask mandate, that obviously put me on this one Right. This is how he is. So then I wasn't asked back to a lot of festivals. And that may or may not be the reason. There might be other reasons, but um, that's all I can speak to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that there's a psychological maturity that happens. And it is that when you're referring to the polarities, the Democrat, conservative, or the whatever issue, pick an issue. I think that the the psychological maturity is to be able to hold multiple perspectives. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. And that's that space in between that I think is such a precious space for those of us who are leaders to be able to stand in and let your yes be yes and your no be no and be clear about that. Mm -hmm. But for you, I would think that all of the years leading up to 2020, and the decisions that you made, there had to be some things kind of brewing that would have set you up or teed you up to be able to take a stand like you did. Yeah, you know, I was lucky to have a, a teacher, a body worker that I got involved, uh, that I got met 15 years ago, who was imparting a lot of wisdom and knowledge about what's going on. And, and the, to, to be honest, people would just say conspiracy theorist. He was somebody who was against the mainstream in every way possible, um, but also teaching health and love. So there was, it was undeni undeniable to me to be like, well, I'm, I'm going to listen to what this guy has to say. And I'm going to, I'm going to think, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to take some, I'm going to do some of my own um, dissecting of what I think, you know, what I'm being told compared to what makes sense. Then it, you know, also follow the health, follow the money that, that solves a lot. Like if you, so just look, if you follow the money, <laughs> you can take all the spiritual and everything else out of it. You'll get some answers, right? Mm -hmm. We know that it was going to be profitable to have, um, a illness that needed a cure and that cure was going to make a certain amount of people a whole lot of money mm -hmm. whether they cured it or not it didn't even matter they didn't even care and that's what I knew so that was the number one seed that was planted for me was about um, uh, medicine modern medicine and how it is a business in a lot of ways um, especially if if people are sick a lot of people are making money and if you're healthy, you're no good to them. Um, so the moment uh, COVID came, and I knew exactly what it was about. In March, I told 
told Amy, I told my wife, I said, I know what this is about. We need to prepare for this. This is about a vaccine mandate. I knew it in March. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got on the defensive and I was like, wait a minute, nothing seems right here. Um, and then I just listened to alternative authorities. I, I took anything mainstream, which I used to listen to, like CNN. And then I looked at the opposite, Fox. Yeah. yeah. So I, look, I listened to both of them. And then I kind of found my own. And then I found other avenues for information that weren't controlled by the same people. Because literally, if you look at the big news media, right, it's like five companies. And they also happen to be connected to the different pharmaceutical companies and oil companies. And if you just follow the dollar... I don't, Everybody's I, didn't, controlled. I didn't need to have intuition. I didn't need to have, I just needed to, to have some common sense mm -hmm. and be like, oh, okay. Yeah. This is, this is different. And when you look at the polarities and you can see that everybody is controlled, then you have an opportunity to extract yourself from that and look for different angles. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me what you think about this. I have discovered that truth has its own frequency. And when you've got a clear vessel, when you're a clear channel, you can pick up on what is true and what is not true, even if people are telling you otherwise. Yes. What's your and, sense of that? Um, yes. And I also believe my truth is, or the truth is, is uncompromising, right? It is what it is for you and for me. However, the quote unquote, my truth is what clouds the actual truth. And that's what happens a lot. So my perspective based on my beliefs that come from my experiences, come from my mm -hmm. past, are then projecting out what this idea of my truth. Um, you know, my teacher, his main thing is truth is uh, it's effortless and uncompromising. So it's just like, duh, simple. Mm -hmm. And this concept of my truth, it's never my truth. It's how I honestly feel right now. One, I then take ownership of my experience rather than saying, well, you made me feel I'm owning, owning it. This is how I honestly feel right now. It's just a feeling. It's emotion, both of which are fleeting. They don't last. It's not going to be there forever. Um, and then I can then say, okay, then what is actually true? Is it true that the way you said something hurt me? That's not, is it, or is it true that your words are hurtful? Absolutely not. Could they hurt me if I choose to let them? Mm -hmm. But then it becomes my choice and it becomes my feelings, not the truth. Um, and I think when you talk about truth as being this universal thing that like you and I can both agree on, um, yes, I think it is kind of like this, oh, I just know it. That I would say is more like a deep intuition or knowing of like when something for me will come through and I'm like, oh, there it is. I either tear up in my eyes or I get the chills. Mm -hmm. For me, my eyes tearing lets me know that I am in alignment yeah. with source, Same. with God, with everything. I will start to all cry about it. Mm -hmm. Happy, sad, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Just, and, yeah. Just that complete alignment and awareness of what you're picking up on in the moment, which goes to a conversation that I want to have with you is about men and emotions. Mm -hmm. I was sharing with you before we started that I have more men in my coming into my private work than I ever have since I was at the university when I saw everybody who'd walk through my door. And one of the things that they're coming in for is to talk about emotions, to resolve emotions, to understand relationships, to do some of the deeper trauma work. I know that you value emotions more so than most men that I've come in contact with. So what's your, what's your take on this whole men, emotions, and masculinity perspective? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, so uh, it, it's been a process for me because I've always been attached uh, um, in touch with my emotions. Mm -hmm. Now, it also came from a space of being not in touch with my masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, I, had, I grew up in a, in a household that it was okay to show your emotions. In fact, a lot of emotions were shown. Um, my father was fairly in touch with his emotions. I saw him cry multiple times. Um, and uh, I never felt like a man. Mm -hmm. So for me, the journey was always, what does it mean to be a man? Because I never felt like one oh, until nice. recently. You know, I'm 44 years old. And it wasn't until my 40s where I actually started to understand what it felt like for me to be a man. So that whole process of me always being in touch with my emotions, and I also believe um, I didn't have emotional maturity 
a um, little bit of emotional intelligence. I knew I could feel what was happening, but there was no maturity with it. I didn't know what to do with the emotion. The emotion just kind of poured out of me, whether it was anger or happiness or sadness. There was no managing or processing the emotion in a mature way. And that led through my 30s for sure. And there was this kind of this intertwining of not knowing what it felt like to be a man, being unsure what that, what that was, and then being overly uh, in, my, in my moon emotions, like I was almost too connected to my emotions, which led to me being a much more feminine man or guy for most of my life. And what I found myself surrounding myself with women, because that's where I felt comfortable. <laughs> and I could feel like a man in the presence of a woman because of the obvious. But when I started, and then I even noticed a lot of my friends throughout my life cycle were much more in touch with their emotions. So I felt safer with them. When I started to meet men who were embodying actual masculine qualities, aligned masculine qualities, all my insecurities started rising to the surface. And that's what came in. That's when I came into Sacred Sons, a men's organization, international men's organization that I watched uh, be birthed and, and take off. And I got to be a part of it. Um, and now I'm a facilitator for them. But that's where my deepest work has come in, is being in the presence of men who are embodying masculinity and feeling massive insecurity around these men. Because I met an aspect of myself that I hadn't met yet, which is this version of me that I didn't think existed because I perceived myself to be confident, the not enough version of Anton. Mm -hmm. He showed up every time I went to one of these Sacred Sons events. Now, when I was teaching the movement or the yoga and stuff, I felt good because I was the leader. I was guiding men into their feminine, mm -hmm. where I felt safe, where I felt comfortable. But when it was time to step into the more masculine things, I started to shrink. And I started to feel small. And I've never really felt small in my life, except for always recognizing that I never felt like a man. And I didn't know what that was. And, and obviously, meeting my wife, Amy, changed things drastically for me for connecting to what masculinity meant more but i was able to feel that around her and in the presence of my wife and then in in the yoga space as well i could feel connected to my masculine but put me around other men who were embodying it whew, nope i would shrink what do you owe that to as you look back on your well, on i can your make life. lots of excuses for what it was one late puberty always being the smallest one okay. having a, a father that Basically, he taught me anything that perceives to be masculine, big trucks, guns, hunting, fighting, any of that is bad, just mm -hmm. bad. So that's what I was taught. And it worked for me because I was a little guy. So I was like, oh, well, cool. This makes sense. Look at my dad was a little guy too. So you can see how that can mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. Um, so then I shied away from it and everything I perceived if they had a big truck, well, that's somebody compensating. Really, that was me feeling insecure around the guy with the big truck who felt confident wearing in a big who, truck. Or he was compensating to and Possib possibly, possibly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it could have been both. Yeah. Um, either way, uh, th that's a lot of the shifting that happened around 2020. I started to move into these more masculine things. I wanted to work on on the the garage door. I started to explore these things that I never would have done before. Um, even hobbies like such as hunting and, and things that I was always against. I'm now thinking, hey, that's a way to provide for my family. Yeah. It's a way to honor an animal with reverence. And it's a way to connect to nature. And these were all things, you know, I thought were, were bad. So that's, that's where a lot of the shifting happened. Um, but it primarily had come with me being, I mean, even to this day, I still can't grow a full beard. I, it's grown in gray. Like I got, I got cheap, I got shorted on it. It's like, I can't even get the full beard and now it's growing in gray as it's growing in. But I always had, I was always felt behind mm -hmm. smaller, younger. I mean, you know, I look younger fairly still. Mm -hmm. um, and that made me feel younger too. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. I yeah. I'm learning so much about, you know, your perspective on what it, the journey to becoming a man. And I've never heard anyone speak about, I just never felt like a man, like mm -hmm. really, truly, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. And I think a lot of, especially what's going on in the world right now, where there's just so much mm -hmm. confusion on man, woman, and mm -hmm. all this nonsense. I think, about okay. Mm -hmm. I want to wade into Barbie for a second. Did you see Barbie? Oh, of you course heard not. About no, no, no. Oh my no, God. No. I will well, entertain that. I decided to go. My husband came with me. You know, my husband, <laughs> <laughs> he walked out halfway through. Yeah. I stayed 
because I wanted to see it the all the way through. Psychology, right? I did. I really wanted to see what are they programming? What are they programming? That's what I, said. I knew it was a programming yeah, and I knew 100%. it was uh, propaganda for mm -hmm. a, a belief. For An agenda. Yeah, agenda, for sure. Of course. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what my husband said was the reason he walked out was because of how emasculating it was to men. Mm. And he doesn't see himself like that. He, it was a, it was a gross overgeneralization for sure um, with an agenda. And then uh, what I, what struck me about it to, to the point of this, the masculine and feminine is the hyper masculinity and the hyper femininity that is on both sides to me, pretty toxic. And I don't think that anybody who's on a, a thoughtful, awake journey is going to align with either of those. And yet that was the the program and the agenda, I think, that was being promoted in that movie. Yeah, even and, just for the little bit that I saw and have heard, that's exactly what yeah. I feel is going on. It's yeah, programming. It's just, and, and, and also, we've been in this process for a couple, I would say five years or so now, of really just um, demasculating the masculine. Mm -hmm. Because who who's the the masculine is the pillar of family yes. it's the protector the provider so if yes. you eliminate that there's no pillar holding up the family values and structure and then society really starts to fall, fall apart and it's easy to then take a society down when you take their weak the strongest people down first yep. take the warriors down first take the warriors down first and then make and then make all of the other men become women which is possible and then the women um which we're supposed to be about women, right? Supporting women. But how is that if we're now taking from the woman to provide for what used to be a man? It, it doesn't even make sense. It's very tangled. It's very, very tangled. tangled. Yeah, and like that. to be able to rise into the whatever the truth of what is going on and to be able to, to stand in the truth for you or for me about what we represent as light workers, light leaders, warriors who are taking a stand for something that is quite different from the overall narrative, I think is such an important yeah. part to acknowledge. Yoga. <laughs> How does all of this inform your teaching, the moving? Oh man, yoga, now it's off all about on the mat. How can I help guide people to become more aware of themselves? How can I help them find greater presence and connect to their body so they can stay strong? What I noticed about yoga is that it can make you weaker, can make you more too supple, uh, too soft, right? Too bendy. And if you bend too much, you're eventually going to break. Um, so what I'm recognizing is that there is a need for greater stability. And the stability isn't just the physical stability, which most yoga, yoga students are des in desperate need of, greater stability, physical stability, you know, joint stability but mental stability too, and mental toughness. So having it become my classes, I think evolved to become a little bit harder over time because I think we need to toughen up society. I need to toughen up myself. We are living in a society that is hypersensitive and weak. And the only way to get past that is to, to get into some discomfort and to then recognize one, take ownership for how we feel by first allowing ourselves to feel. And I think the movement aspect is what gets people to feel themselves. They can feel their bodies. Now they're aware of, okay, something's going on here. Then they can take it a deeper level into the mindset piece of like, okay, why am I feeling this way? Well, I'm going to sit with this feeling. But the bottom line, it's awareness. Awareness of how I move, awareness of what I'm thinking, awareness of how I'm breathing. Because if I can make people more aware, they will be less likely to behave in in ways that I believe are misaligned or out of integrity. Because it took me to have awareness to recognize when I was out of integrity. Mm -hmm. But well, it, when I had to have that awareness. When I'm in your class, I always feel like I'm training for a light, like a light warrior. I really mm -hmm. do. And I, I wanted to share that with you because that's something that's so important and vital in my own work is the, the mind, the mind, body, spirit connection, especially for the high frequency channeling work that I do. And I always feel like when I'm in yoga with you, that you're channeling, what's your perspective on channeling? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this idea of um, channeling, you know, there are channeled text that I yes. read. Uh, I've, I've read several um, Seth speaks the Magdalene mm -hmm. manuscripts. Um, so there are things that I, I believe someone who is basically 
something, someone, something else was providing information and then it was flowing through them. The way I see channeling for myself is when I'm in uh, my zone of genius and a creative flow and or when I'm simply just open to receive all the information that is there and provided for all of us all the time. Now, the reason why we don't fly or walk on water is because of limiting beliefs. So I haven't chosen to walk on water yet because I still have limiting beliefs um, in regards to what is possible within this third world dimension that we're choosing to live in. And I think that goes to everything. Um, we have, I have to ask myself, where am I still holding on to a belief that is keeping me from accessing greater information about myself or anything else? My limiting beliefs. Why am I not making a million dollars yet? Well, what is my belief about me being worthy enough to make a million dollars, about what it means to have a million dollars, or whatever the story may be? So there's and all of my, so I am able to access any and all information that the universe has ever had within it if I'm open to it. And there are some moments when those openings happen and the information flies in and I start to remember or I get the cue or I get the intuition hit. This morning was a perfect example and I love that it happened. I was working with a client on a Zoom call and um, she has a thing about uh, lizards and frogs. And my wife had mentioned something that there was some insight to what that was for her. I shared it with her. She got hairs rising up on the back mm -hmm. of her neck. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. This also explains why a certain relationship in your life went the way it did. And it was like, I, it just came super clear to me to understand, oh, that thing that we had talked about before, that's actually a part of this. So what happens is the information just comes to me because I'm open. Because the information is always there. I just sometimes can't see it because of my yeah. limiting my limiting belief or my own perspective based on my own experiences don't you think too that the more you're in your body the easier it is to pick up on what's available to us I mean if you're not in your body if you're not connected how do you pick hmm. up on anything interesting so we, we know they have a lot of people uh, psychics and and people light workers and stuff who tend to be physically unhealthy mm -hmm. almost because they neglect the physical form because yes. they're so focused on the upper chakras and the energy yes. up here yes um so there's like a disconnect between the body mm -hmm. and then dis-ease happens because of that disconnect so i do think that the more we are aware of everything and anything the more you know awareness breeds choice choice is what freedom is so if i'm more aware i have more choices and i have more opportunities to experience things um so i think there's that and that connection to the body yeah i, I think the well here's the other piece is the body's constantly talking to us right mm -hmm. and like the book um the body keeps the score and, and all these other amazing books and things like germanic new medicine where it's showing okay your mind and your body are connected and your body telling you what's really going on inside so take some time to listen to your body. So what's my hip? My hip being sore. What is that really telling me? Oh, it can say, yeah, because you've been doing a lot of jujitsu. Or I can look at it on a deeper level and be open to being like, well, maybe it's something different. What does that muscle really associate with? Well, it's a hip flexor psoas. Well, that's fight or flight. Hmm. What have I been afraid of lately? I didn't think I was afraid. Oh, oh, I've been, oh, I've been worried about that. That's right. That's fear. Okay. And then I- And once you name it, once you name it, you can transform it. So good. Yeah. It's like, and I love that you said, once you name it. So once I named that there was still insecure Anton, I had to like mm -hmm. own the fact that we call it shadow, right? Your right. shadow is the aspect of yourself that you haven't brought into the light because you're either embarrassed or ashamed or whatever it is about that. But all that version of you wants is attention, right? Just like a little kid, my little, mm -hmm. my kids, if I don't give them the right attention, they will do something to get the attention. 100%. So will my shadow mm -hmm. and my shadow will do things like break my ankle. Or my shadow will get me in a car accident or get me fired from work or do the, all the things that I'm not paying attention to because the shadow's like, you weren't listening to me. You weren't listening to this aspect of yourself and, and not witnessing it and, and accepting it. And that's the key word that, that I've learned is that what acceptance is, it's the, um, or what love is, is, the acceptance of all things. And anytime I'm judging or criticizing, I'm not accepting it. So if I can learn to accept aspects of myself instead of criticize aspects of myself, 
then they become tools for my evolution and my growth. So good. How are you? You have three boys, is that right? Three now, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. How are you transmitting the knowledge and the awarenesses that you have now about men and masculinity to your boys? The What I'm really working on for myself is this tough and tender, tough mm. and tender, tough and tender. How can dad be more tough and tender? Create some structure for them. Have a little bit of discipline. Um, well, one the one thing that's really easy for me is to show my tenderness. Sure. Because anytime they do something that I have like joy or pride from, I cry. Mm. It's called daddy's happy tears. Like mm. it's a silly thing. Those boys have seen me cry so many times, but the majority of the times they see me cry, it's out of joy. So when they have permission and then it's re- me reminding them, you're allowed to cry. And, and they're even to a point now where um, one of my sons, he got hit in, in the throat, he got poked in the throat mm-hmm. and you could tell he was struggling. He was hurting. He was scared and he was hyperventilating with his crying. And I said, you got to stop to breathe. You got to stop to breathe. He said, don't tell me to stop. Crying is okay, daddy. I said, you're right. You're right. Crying is okay. And we need to focus on the breath. We need to focus mm-hmm. on breathing here. Um, and then being the example. And one of the things I have found for myself, one of, one of my sons is very intense. And um, he, he, like myself, struggles with um, anger. And he, he'll, he'll act out. And what I realize is I, I have to, if he's up here, I have to meet him down here. So I have to soften when the things get engaged. Because if I start to raise my voice, oh, he will meet me way up in the scale here. So it's just like softening. And it's still a process of like my facial expressions because my face tells the story of what I'm feeling. And he is in tune. Talk about intuitive. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. He can look at my face. He's like, why are, you do- why, why are you doing that? Or if I'll say something a certain way, he said, why did you say it like that? He's just so precise and so clear. So then it makes me more sharp to be like, okay, I'm literally practicing daily in my cold plunge, how to keep my face in a neutral place. Wow. That's become my practice. Yeah. Yeah. And and the boys see me, they see me doing hard things. So one thing um, I work out around them and they're on the house. Um, I do wall sits to points where like I'm shaking and I fall. I want them to see me doing hard things. Um, One of my sons, the oldest, he's actually done cold plunge with me. He's gotten into the ice water with me to recognize that it's okay to be uncomfortable. So my big thing is teaching them uh, to do hard things and, and it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Yeah. So good. It is okay to be uncomfortable. Yep. It takes a long time to learn that. Regulating the nervous system is one of the greatest challenges I think we have as humans. And I think that one of the greatest tools is cold plunge for that. For how to regulate nervous system. Yoga is right. helpful because you're, yeah. you're moving and you're breathing and how to regulate your breath because your breath is what regulates your nervous system, but it's still not, uncomfortable. It's not uncomfortable enough. Yeah. Maybe my goddess pose sometimes in my classes when we're holding goddess pose yeah. for three minutes, yeah. maybe then it's uncomfortable enough, but for the most part, it's just not enough discomfort. And I think a lot of people within yoga are looking to feel good in a yoga pose and that's problematic as well. And I also think even as yoga teachers, I know I did, I wanted everyone to feel good because then they would come back. Oh, that's my ego. Shit. Mm-hmm. So when I started to get in, in, in better integrity with myself and what my purpose was, it was, I just want you to feel. I don't care what you feel. Just be open to feeling because maybe you're not doing that at home. And if well, you felt uncomfortable and that makes you want to come back or not want to come back, I have to be okay with it either way. That's, that's such a principle of mindfulness practice though, isn't it? It's be with what is. Mm -hmm. And every, every yoga practice can be different in that way. And every meditation practice can be different in that way. It's being aware of what you're feeling when you're feeling it without judgment and with compassion. And that's one of the hardest things to do. And this kind of ties back to the original question about men and emotions, right? So somewhere along the line, and some generationally, right? I, I'm not sure if you subscribe to this too, but seven generations is passed mm-hmm. down with us. Yeah. So yeah. my grandfather's 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 grandfather um, probably at some point said something about emotions being weakness or, or whatever. Um, so I think for men, it's the willingness because every man feels has emotions. <laughs> like mm-hmm. They can pretend, they may not show them, but they are feeling them. 
And if they don't process it or use it in an effective and productive way, that's when trouble starts happening. Either one of two things typically happens. It becomes an explosion Mm -hmm. in the form of usually violence when it comes to men, or it becomes an illness in the body, right? It becomes bottled up, turns all moldy and yucky inside. And then now you have cancer, you have a disease and the disease happens. Um, And those are typically the two things that happen if we don't access or pay attention to those emotions. But every man feels something. Every man feels something. So then what are we going to do to get them to be with that? Well, at Sacred Sons, they have found the the magical recipe is uh, physical confrontation. No kidding. Getting punched in the face or punching another man in the face. Because everyone has a story with being punched or punching. Either maybe you were abused as a child and it's very uncomfortable and you don't want to return to that trauma. Maybe you were the abuser and you don't want to be that anymore. And it's then learning that we can use this as play. And all, you know, all the civilizations before us, that's how they train. You look at our mammals, right? My two dogs, they're biting each other's throats. Mm -hmm. My two kids without being trained are wrestling because that's how we learn to feel each other out. But when we stepped away from that because something bad happened, father beat you, um, you ended up beating somebody, violence was bad. Like I was told violence is bad, period. You don't do it. Um, other people have other experiences. We all have our story with what, what that means. And then the moment you punch somebody, you have to face what that is for you. The moment you get punched, you have to face that. Maybe it's the fear of getting hit. Maybe it's the fear. One of the stories that comes up is I can't control myself. If someone hits me, I turn red and I go to 10. Well, that's a problem. You don't know how to regulate your own emotion. So, all right, we're going to punch you in the face and you're going to learn to command yourself, to be in command of your energy when things are upright. We call it, um, we use a term called primal recalibration. Um, Basically, it's learning to access these different emotions, these different energies. Oftentimes it's rage and then regulating to a calm state after. Yes, I can feel it. And I can also come back. Yeah. I could listen to you talk about this all day. Mm. Anton, what do you have coming up that you want to share with our listeners? Oh, thanks. Yeah. Invite so them into your world. My world has a lot to do with the world of Sacred Sons, so sacredsons.com, uh, the men's group that, that I'm a part of. It's international. We've got two events coming up. Um, Second week in August in Colorado is what we call an EMX, an embodied masculine experience. It's a weekend event, three nights, men gathering together. I think this one's going to be over 50 men together um, for uh, confrontation, connection, and celebration. Um, Then we have our big retreat, uh, lack of better words, it's called Convergence. And this is happening in LA the first week in October, October 7th through 10th, I believe. Um, I think that's open to 150 participants. Uh, and that's where we dive deep with the full leadership team within Sacred Sons. Um, that they can find all the information on sacredsons.com. And then myself, I'm a part of two yoga teacher trainings. And, and what I've done within the yoga teacher trainings that I've been a part of, I've added a, an empowerment component to it. So really talking about how to manage and uh, access these different emotions, what it means to have um, conscious commitments to leadership. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, so the, the yoga teacher programs that I get to, to lead or co-lead all have these in them. And I've got a, a training coming up in Scottsdale, Arizona, it's in Old Town Scottsdale at a yoga studio called CA Yoga Bar. That's the first weekend in September 7th is when that one starts. And then another one in Colorado at a yoga studio in Golden, Colorado, starting the second week in February of 2024. Uh, all these can be found on my website, which is just antonyoga.com. And I'm also uh, opening up my books for more clients. I do work one-to-one with men and women. And then in three months and three months i'll be starting my empowerment group coaching program which is an online coaching so good. Program as well yeah i am so grateful that you're in this world doing this work thank you i appreciate that I, i'm gr- grateful that you are able to receive me the way that mm. you do because you know not everyone does and and you're able to see me for what i'm here to offer and bring so i appreciate you and i see you for this amazing stuff you're doing and thank you and your presence in my yoga class so i thank, thank you. you so much for that yeah Well, you know what I always say is that I'm not Nutella. I'm not for everybody. 
<laughs> and and uh, neither are you. And that is, it's actually polarizing in a very, very good way because yeah. when we know who we're for, then it's easy to be supportive of them, to see them and to bring them along with us. So I appreciate that. being here. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. All right. I, we will see you everybody next time. Thanks, Anton. Thank you.